And uh, so he was going to come in, because I would hear him in the back door saying, no, if you're scared, you got a my pastor in here, I'm going to you. Mm -hmm. So when I heard him, I hollered back to him and said, well, Dane, I'm coming out. I'm all right. Is that you, Rev? You all right? And that's what I said. Mm -hmm. I said, yeah, I'm all right. I'll be out of here. Go out and tell everybody to be quiet. So he was happy. He turned around and went on back out. He passed his police for the standing. Mm -hmm. so, so I put my coat on. I go out there and go to the back. And here was this burning of police. I hit him right along in here somewhere. He's a big, big guy. Mm -hmm. I weigh at least 300 pounds, 208 or something. And uh, he had his cap on, and he looked, we, we were at the back room, see, it was a three-room house, a six-room house, mm -hmm. and we were about to the back room, and he come off the back porch, get on the ground, and he looked, and he saw me, and he took his cap off, and, and took his handkerchief out, and rubbed his eyes. I wondered, I'd never seen a policeman cry before, I, mm -hmm. I thought he was, but I didn't say anything. So then he um, turned around, put his cap on, walked maybe from here that door. Still would have been not quite up to the middle of the house. He turned around and looked at me again, wiped his head, shook his head. So I'm walking along. So he's ahead of me as far as near that door now. So he walked on up maybe, I guess, another time, the distance between where I am and that door, 25 feet which would be a little bit beyond the middle of the house. We hadn't got to the crowd yet. And and on this side of the house, he said, on that. and he said, uh, he hadn't spoken all this time. He said, Reverend, I'm so sorry. He said, I know these people. Said, I didn't think they'd go this far. I really didn't think this go, they would go this far. He said, I'm sure not sorry. He said, well, I'll tell you what I'd do if I were you. I'd get out of town as quick as I could. Well, I hadn't spoken to him either. So I said, officer, I always call him officer. I said, officer, you're not me. And you go back and tell your clan brother that if the Lord could keep me through this and bring me out of this, tell him the war is on and I'm here for the duration. It just began. He didn't say no more. He turned around and walked on. And I walked out right behind him. And as I, as the Lord would have it, all policemen want to show their authority. You know, the people were really upset. It could have been a big thing. Mm -hmm. Had I not sent Mr. Revis back out to tell folks I was all right and to be quiet and calm. But a policeman had talent, some young Negro there. Just as I got past the porch, through the hedge, go to the streets. And this Negro was looking at this police, this policeman was saying something. He, he went to put it down his gun, this Negro had, had a knife. He said, he said you and I cut your so-and-so throat. And this policeman, he could have pulled his gun out. Mm -hmm. And so I, I pat him on the shoulder. I said, now we don't need that. I said, now also you need to control yourself. What you do, if you can't control yourself, I have to call down to them. I said, they're excited. Mm -hmm. So I have to call down and get you moved out there. I said, because you're going to cause anybody in the harm out here tonight. Mm -hmm. This is the same officer? No, not the call. same. The big one that's going on. Okay. So I went on to my car. See, I was going to the car as they were there. I think some of them had wanted to come in, you know, or something. The police trying to get back. You know how police can do it. So I went on and, and, and uh, sat in the back of the car that was waiting for me. I don't really know now whether it was mine or somebody had to take me to be checked out. But as I sat in the back of my car, this had this coat on and, and the pants, and my little daughter was six years old, and the baby that said, Washington. She always sucked the finger at me. So she came and curled up in my lap, and put her finger in my looked up in my face. They can't kill us, can they, Dad? I said, no, darling, they can't kill who? That's his start. That's what the man said. And she, she said, so they can't kill us, can they, Dad? That was a night of nights. But I remember something. I had a sense of the presence. 
Nobody can teach you that. It's not, you can't write it in a book fully. Now, of course, that was designed to kill the movement, to kill the movement. people away, to kill the movement. And I got the next day, and this is the other thing. You know, it's it's amazing what God uh, The average person would have been scared and been gone. So uh, I said to the, the, the people in the movement who came, I said, we're going to meet first thing in the morning. Because so we had said we were going to ride the buses. The Klan didn't intend for me to be around two rides. And uh, the, uh, so when daylight came, the police, right, and they went over there to chat. I said, no, let us stay there. People are coming from everywhere to just pass by to see it. So I thought they should see it. I said, no, we got time to get it down. I said, it didn't fall last night. It'll stand up a while. And uh, so I'm trying to think where it was. It was, it was in Revis's house or but out there that I, uh, Alfred was one of the key ones, Reverend Alfred, who said, I think we're going to make this thing. And E. Reverend Stone, who's my vice president at that time, said, uh, President, I think we need to really go somewhere. I said, all right, everybody meet down the gas. So that the people heard me tell them, meet down to, uh, Gas and thing down here on 16th Street, wherever it was. Motel. Not the motel. Funeral home. Funeral home. Okay. Well, that was, yeah. And you'd be surprised at how God makes things come out sort of fresh. That's where you're going where I'm going. And uh, so uh, I knew I had to take total charge of the situation no, to be a mess that day. First of all, I was a challenge to ride. There was a need to be sure the people were disciplined to right? remember none violence. And there was a need to do what we say, else we'd have been dead. The movement, I mean. I could have been alive, and yet the movement wouldn't go unless we had at least announced the time to ride. That's it. So when we got in, I said uh, to the movement, and you know, it, it, the Lord does say, I was preaching something more about how he made those uh, Israelites, Egyptians, give them most of their jewels and stuff before they left, so they had most of the riches of Egypt. Mm -hmm. uh, I said to the news man, we were friends, I said, now, gentlemen, I want to say something to y'all. I said, now, I have to talk inside. I said, and, and I'm going to give you a scoop today. Uh, and it's worth your way, but I cannot have you in the meeting. With your respect that for us. Yeah. I said, but don't go away now because it's, when I come out, uh, I'll have a scoop for you. And I'll let you in. You know exactly when we're going to ride. Well, they thought I'm going to be the side of two ride. Now, inside, fear, fear is something. Most of my board members, I had ordered them to ride. I said, all the board members go ride to show the other folks. And uh, I was moved at how fearful it was. Reverend Stone said, and Alpha was almost behind Now, my president, I think that we ought to take time and think this thing out. I said, well, what is that to think of? I said, we said we were going to ride. I said, Let, and more than that, when I knew I was alive after the bombing, that's the first thing on my mind. We're going to do what we said we're going to do. I said, it's time for Negro to learn to do what you say you're going to do. And so he, Albert went on to say something there, but one little slender fellow, I wish I knew his name. He said, now my president, we come in to hear what you got to say. We didn't come in to hear these scared folks. We gonna do what you, and he was actually crying, a lot of other people crying. Mm -hmm. But first of all, here I am alive. Mm -hmm. I said, well, all right, let me just say to everybody, so now, so for the members of the board, if you all are nervous, are scared to ride, I said, when I leave here, we go into the buses. I said, now, I want to look back, find you any crack that you want and hide if you can't ride. I said, I'm not commanding you, you're free from that. You don't have to ride because I say so. Mm -hmm. I said, but I think enough people here will ride. Said, How many of y'all want to ride with me? All the whole house went up. I think it even made some of the board members feel. I said, I said, now let's get together. 
Now you would think this is something after a night of a bumming, terrifying, but I was as calm as a cucumber, even in that bumming when they were. Uh, I said to them, now we got to get ourselves ready. In the first place, I said, oh, y'all want to ride? Yeah. I said, now be sure you want to ride. Don't have to. I said, but somebody's going to ride if it's nobody but me. Well, where would you go? I said, well, I want you to ride. I don't want you to ride with me. I said, we're going down to 18 and 19 speed, 24 up in there where the bus is crisscross. Right. I said, we want to ride all over town. So I don't want you to get on, just go on one place. Go all over. Be sure somebody goes everywhere the buses go. I said, that's one thing. The other thing, when you get on the bus, don't gang up like black birds. I said, I don't want no two black folks sitting together up front. I said, all, every, all black folks going to sit up front, but leave space for your white brother to sit there. One, two, three. Yeah. I said, I don't want two white black folks sitting there. I said, you sit down and you sit over here so white folks have to sit or I'll let them stand. I said, you all understand it took time. I think I think one of the things that that really made the melody go well with my calmness. I wasn't excited. I said, uh, and then nobody asked me was I nervous. I said, now one reason the press, I had to put the press out because if the press heard me say we're going to ride a date, the police would be up there, we can't get to the buses. I said, so the next thing is I don't want anybody here to gang up around me when we go out from here. Go, or somebody start walking this way. But the, the goal is that so many minutes be down in those four block areas where you crisscross the buses. I said, let the press talk. You be saying talking about nothing. I said, but we must get to the buses today if we're going to make history. I said, clan made that history land now. We make ours for God today. And they were so glad. First of all, glad I was alive. It was crying for them. I said, we don't have to get emotional about it. Now, my oldest daughter had been born, not from the bunny. And here again, God does some things for you. But stop to tell you this, because see, people have to understand that God is saving us every day, and we don't know it. She would get up early with an out and gown and help her mama cook in the morning. And it so happened, I was traveling everywhere then. I would just come home and change clothes and get right back on the road for days at a time. And so it happened that night that I stayed home. I didn't come in and go right out. I stayed till the next morning, which I was going out the next day because I had invitations everywhere. And she'd get up early and she had this out and gown on and was standing in front of an open face uh, in that out and caught fire. And I'm lying in bed. I hear my wife saying, Oh, Pat, oh, Pat, oh, oh, Pat, what? And she was, and I got up, the girl's gown was burning up the back of her thigh. My oldest daughter was burning on it. And he was in the stomach. And it was, I see, because she was reaching her hair. And I just threw her down and beat the uh, flames out, burnt my fingers and so forth. So she had to go to the hospital. They had to kind of thing, an old hole, just like you. You're like, like a blank pig, you know. But she was real touchy. One thing, and I thank God for it today, she ain't gonna make nothing come here to church. All she was saying is she was hate you, Miss Church. Mm. But I rode to see her. That's the only place I was going. And I was going back home, you see, to see whatever else happened with anybody else there. But. So then I called the pressure, and after I had everybody calm, I said, now you all decide. Two, three people want to ride in every area. At least three or four. Uh, I called the press in. I said, gentlemen, you all want to, uh, the scoop I don't give you? Yeah. I said, well, you, I'm sure you want to be announced to you today when we're going to ride, right? Yeah. 
I said, I appreciate you. I said, I got one more thing to ask. I said, in the first place, I said, suppose I, I said, you want to know the date? Yeah, I said, before I tell you the date, let me ask you a favor. I said, whenever we ride and the press see me talking to you, the police see me talking to you, they're going to know that I'm going to do something because they know I'm in action. I said, so whatever I tell you, I don't want you to go ahead of us whenever that is, all right? I said, because you go ahead of us at the bus, at the cop, or no, we come here, we won't even get there. I said, y'all know that? Yeah, yeah. I said, Could, would you promise that whenever we ride, uh, you won't just go way up ahead of us? You, I said, stay with us. Just talk to folk. You, we know where we, the bus is going. And these things. One of them said, well, you ain't said when. I said, I'll tell you when, when you tell me what. I said, if you can agree to that, then I'll tell you when we're going to ride. He said, oh, yeah, we're going to follow you. You're always a wet with us. We have respect for what you've done. I said, okay. I said, we're going to ride there. They go right there. I said, yeah, we're going to ride there. Right now, in fact. I said, so don't go ahead of us. Talk to people. Stay behind. All of them. Some of you can talk to me and talk. And we went up and it over. Over 250 people rode that day, all over. Hmm. And this is right after the bomb. Next day. 56. Next day. Hmm. And uh, were you arrested? No. Nobody was arrested. I, I rode. See, the police thought we were going to go down the side to ride next two, three days. They were getting ready for this. So they were not prepared. When they heard anything, we had already arrested. So they did arrest uh, 22. Mm -hmm. I believe it was one. Maybe the first round was two. Yeah, that's right. It was 22. That's right. 22. Uh, and then give us the thing to make the case. So we didn't have to continue, right? right. Uh, so I went over to the hospital, saw my daughter, and went back home. And by the way, the press was with me, you know, so I got him and gave up. So we were sitting down, the young white girl got up, so I about halfway there, I said, Would you like me have my seat? <laughs> it was it was mad. But that's how we did, and, and 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 people were right. And I said, they said, God saved him to lead the fight. And that's how I got to be the leader. What because you couldn't have gotten black folk in Birmingham to vote, to face nothing like that. Mm -hmm. And I don't think most of the people who write about it understand. Even Dr. King was candid enough to say, I could not have done and survived and led people in Birmingham. Mm -hmm. See? But the booming, see, God does things in a way that you don't know about, but he is like the Red Sea. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that's the only reason I'm alive. Yeah. So, that's why I think you should put those pictures up so folks can see what you come through. Mm -hmm. That's why I live with them. Why yeah. I didn't have to fight for leadership. Yeah. So the people actually saw what had happened. Yes. And that was like your baptism. That's my baptism, but it was leadership. It was induction into leadership. Mm -hmm. They knew that I wasn't afraid because if I could come out of that and get up and ride the bus the next day, challenging the system, segregation, mm -hmm. is it always, mm -hmm. not just to show me. So in effect, you, along with the people, then set the example yes. for the rest of the, the your leaders. Yes, in effect, because yes. they were basically afraid. They were afraid. They were afraid. And... Uh, but that did a lot. See, that bumming and my coming out of it. And then, see, I could I could afford to preach God will provide. God will take care of me. And then I was never afraid. See, I was always saying that moving into something else. Mm -hmm. See, I never just stopped on the ground conquered you. With that thing, the old Christian vernacular said, each victory that you went over saying, help you some other to win. Fight man for their own, and 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 that's been my drive. And I guess I'm a little bothered today because black people they think they got it together, but they don't have it together. And we've allowed the drug subculture, we've allowed rock and roll, we've allowed rapping and other things to sort of take the idealism from the forward march. Mm -hmm. And then there's a tendency now, you can, one of the things that disturbed Martin Luther King before he died was, you can't guarantee that you would have a non-violent march at any time. Right. 
doing the vows in, in, that, in Memphis. And, uh, but he was committed to doing the vows, and so am I. And that was very significant because that basically was the stance of the movement. Yeah. And that again was part of that uh, belief that you had. In order to really believe in the Bible, you have to have that belief in God. You see, one of the, I don't know where you want to just start talking about incidents. We can get a thousand. Right. St. Augustine, Florida, here. But that was just the bumming thing. Mm -hmm. But one of the other most significant incidents, and there were many, mm -hmm. and I guess we'll get to them. Yeah, let's get to them. We have time for okay. take for about for one of them now. Yeah. Uh, in 1957, that was a tremendous year. We had to start off with the uh, Cardinal Lazenia Bowen in March, and the court denied our petition for the school. Mm -hmm. Uh, and so then it said something about the placement law, about will come up the placement law. So I decided to make about will place our children. Mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. I knew segregation. I wasn't moved. And the Supreme Court could have declared it unconscious, but said they would let it lie on its face in application. And here again, I blame the Supreme Court because you see, white flight is largely a result of the negligence of the court in moving to do things. Mm. That's significant. That's significant. And another thing I would say, if I had any one biggest problem I had with Martin after we came in, won the victory, because people in Birmingham after that would have done anything. Mm. We had the victory. Mm. I said to him, the next thing ought to be us to integrate these schools so the white folk will run. Because we went to sell as you know, and then to St. Augustine, Florida. Mm -hmm. But I said, if, if we if we integrate Birmingham school before the white folks move out, that will start other across. You must re realize that you throw a rock in the water and it has ripple effect. Mm -hmm. And I was I was real disappointed. Uh, many writers have questioned Martin's, uh, and and there are questions to be raised about it. But I was concerned the integration city. Martin was concerned with his name and doing his name. I think we both had kindred ideas, and naturally he would have had his image to deal with. And mm -hmm. I don't mind supporting his image so long as it does here. Mm -hmm. You see, the violation of the <coughs> court order that had to be. Well, no way that Martin Luther King was going to come to Birmingham and get that many people in jail and not violate the court order. That's a whole other thing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that's where we had this uh, confrontation with the even Bob President of the United States, right. where I was bummed, went to the hospital at night, yeah. struck the yeah. fire That's a chapter in itself. Yeah. But uh, all in all, and I just said this, and maybe we won't get into detail. Let me ask you to just to, to talk briefly about the incident at Phillips High School. Oh, at Phillips, 57, September. Okay. The court said that the board had a right to place students. By way that pupil placement law. Well, I knew he wasn't going to pay a lot of Negro students in white. And I didn't think mine was going to really get in Philip, being honest with you. But history would have to recall that we attempted to do it. That was why. And that's the second time I came, 90% of dying. Right there. So I was in the Phillips High School So I always announced and sent the police and everything what I was going to do. And I must candidly say to you now, the, the policemen that were there were enough to have prevented what did happen had they wanted to. Okay. But the climate intended that day, they had missed me in the bunk. 56 Christmas night. Right. It did about Christmas again, September 57. And I'm harassing and everything. 
So they said, they met there and they said, let's get this SOB. I don't mean to suck. So if we kill him and they don't listen to that. It's all over. Where is the prison? In front of Philip Classical. If you there, this, this is what they're discussing. As you they were saying, when I'm getting driving up, getting out the car. Mm. Here he is, let's kill this SOB today, and it's all over. See, I'd never seen brass knuckles before that day. And other things. And so it was two, it was maybe it was well, I'm trying to say was it three or five police in there. And uh, so when I, my two dogs in the back, and the young man with my wife were in the back. They were in the back. My wife on the side, so she got out. So when I got out, they came, they went at the car. Here again, you must look at the faithfulness of God. I, when I blew up, I, that just now I'm like, I'm going to get out and go in. And the guy was, uh, it was going over the hood. They took my coat and put it over my head. I could have fought had I wanted to. Mm -hmm. They carried me, kicking, stomping, and knocked me down. I must have fallen at least three or four times within the space of 30 feet, 25, 20 feet from the car. Mm -hmm. And uh, they were kicking and stomping and howling. And, and, and one policeman said to him, you and this black jack or something said to him, oh, you don't have to do that. I think they intend to let me too. Oh. Whether they intend to let them kill me or not, I can't do it. But I know the Klansmen intended to. So one guy had a bicycle chain. No one had brass knuckles. I struck the brass knuckles at least twice. And uh, kicked me. And as God would have it, and my wife got out to get the girl and the young man out the back, and she had on a real thick gun. And one clam stabbed her in the hip with swift lady knife. She didn't even know that she was stabbed until the doctor was over examined me in the hospital and the hip starts dying. You had to stay in there, had to take care of us. So we never got beyond the sidewalk. So they put her, after they stabbed her, she had to get back in the car. And they didn't even bother the car. Look at what God did. Pfeiffer had the sense of mind to wait. He didn't drive off. They were not attacking the car. They intended to kill me on the street that day. Right. Sorry. Yeah. And the door was left open of the car. So they had taken me down, oh, I guess, mm, toward that corner at least twice, kicking and stomping and hitting me. And, and um, I've been struck. And it was early morning, about 9, 10, 10 o'clock, between 10 and 11, somewhere. And I began to understand that if I keep getting hit, if I might hit, the light would become gray. And um, I realized I had to get back to the car. And I began to just discern where the car was. And I was about, hey, I'm about to lose consciousness, but. God wouldn't have it unless I would have died on the sidewalk. So I was, began to struggle to get back to the car. So they were pummeling me and hitting me, but we were going back toward the door. And uh, one guy was, had a chain. He got right in front of the car door. He didn't shut the door. And he was swinging his chain. I could discern. And, 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 and the guy had struck me with the brass knuckles again. And it was just, just gray and dull. And I knew if this guy had hit, he was set to hit me again across the head with that chain. And uh, I knew if he, hit, if he hit me again, I'd fall right there. And so he was like, and, uh, and I said on the hot CBS film, who speaks for money? And the mob is so out of control that they're not really in control of what happens right. all the time. And so while he was getting ready and, and uh, uh, to swing, I just, I knew I had to get in the car, so I just sort of stumbled into him. He bowled over, he didn't even get a chance to hit me. And I uh, fell into the car, and five of the cars had pulled my arms in the car. And as I was getting in the car, one guy kicked me into my side. And I had just a slight few drops of blood in my urine, only at the time that day. And the, the I saw the camera, I wish I could find it, but when we turned away, he probably was driving away to that next street from the, that way. My feet were still hanging out the door. 
Your wife and children in the back. They were in the back. They were shut up. And you, you feel just right. I feel out of the door as we were going off. So then we go to the hospital. <laughs> then these two little nurses cleaning me up, white, both white. One of them was segregated. It was me. And she was saying, I don't, damn, why let somebody do something at me? Why? What? What? So, so I said, on, I said, well, you, and the other girl was trying to hush up. I said, well, you wouldn't understand if I told you. And they were cleaning me up. See, I was skin was all off. And I've been struck here and here, and I really felt my arms bro. So they kept on. I just didn't say anything else. And so the other girl said, well, they just keep asking me. Told you wouldn't understand. After I looked back an eternity, it wasn't that long, the doctor came in, master, low fellow, he came in so apologetic and he was so sorry. And he said, Well, Reverend, I, I'm so sorry about this. And you know, lying on that uh, thing out, everybody who could walk, it was all old TV, you know, would come by and look at me, you know, I'm there like a skin pea. Mm -hmm. And the doctor said, so he took me in the, in the uh, took me in the uh, examining room, x-ray. And I don't know how many x-rays he took me. We let him come back and do it over or something. And after a while he said, uh, I guess you wonder why I, I'm taking some of He said, look like me. He said, you have terrible beat. He said, I'm trying to find a crack in your head, at least a contusion. I think that's a small crack. He said, but I can't find it. The x-ray don't show it. I didn't bother. I said, well, doctor, the Lord knew I live in a hard town, so he gave me a hard skull. And he took my pressure after a while, and it was gone. I wasn't upset. Pressure was Yeah. I was, up, I was just as calm as a cucumber in September. But I knew I had to get to the movie that night, because Negroes had gone through a whole lot, and I knew that after the bombing, with all of this, if 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 they weren't contained this night, violence could easily happen. So I went home, and I, so so the doctor said, "Well, I'd like for you to stay at least all night so I can observe you." He said, "I can't order you, but I, I'd like for you to." I said, "Well, doctor, I'm glad you can't order me because I'd have to resist the order." I said, the first place, the only way I was willing to stay, you'd have to have two policemen inside, two outside to know the white fence. I said, now, if I die at home, I would die among my friends. But I, I think I'm all right. He said, well, I understand, Robert, and I will release you. But I really wish I could have done it because you're going to have some problems. I said, no more problem than the Lord want me to have. He admired my courage and all that. I went on home. And I knew I had to get back to this. So we were at Stone Church on New Hope, and just over that bridge. Right there. And you couldn't get around to, again, here again. People were half a block almost around that church because it's all over you. Is that it? Well, yeah. we, can, we can start that tomorrow. But since, uh, since that, you know, what, you, what you've done there, you've put another piece into the to the bombing piece. Yeah, because this is another. See, all of that, of course, is designed to kill the movement when, in effect, it was doing just the opposite. Doing just the opposite. And with those ministers who were afraid, the people, with your help, your leadership, were the ones that went on to, to yeah. carry it on. I mean, that's that's phenomenal. That's fascinating. Yeah, well, man, you, you learned your key today. <laughs> Yes, indeed. So the, the just give me a, a, a little um, more on the the mob violence at Phillips High School that you were discussing yesterday. Yeah, it was one of the three or four incidents where I was right in death row that God would let me die. Uh, and I said yesterday, they really intended to kill me. They uh, they felt, they were shouting it out. Let's kill this, that's going to be in other words. Uh, and it's all over. And I was aware 
and they were trying to kill me. And it's an amazing thing how you can submit yourself even under pressure and even understand. People must understand that faith goes much farther than, than we believe and we understand. Uh, it takes over, I guess, when you can't do anything else anyway. Um, as I said, they had taken me sort of 20, 30 feet from the car. And I had to kind of stumble and cajole, and, uh, not cajole, not fight with them, so I couldn't afford it anyway. Yeah. But stumbling back toward the car because I realized that every lick caused the brilliance to turn into a sort of a grave. And uh, on my way back to the car, amid the kicks and the curses and the slanders, people running to each other trying to do me harm, uh, I was struck again with a chain. And I realized, I struck in, I'm sorry, with the brass knuckles. Mm -hmm. And I realized that if I had got another lick, I probably would have couldn't have even made it to the car. But I was very determined to make it, so I just, they were holding and pulling and so forth. And I was just coming to the car. And as I said yesterday, one guy was sitting near the door of the car and he was swinging, the, swinging that chain. He had struck me with it already once or twice. Mm -hmm. And uh, I knew if he hit me, I wouldn't make it into the car. And so, uh, and I don't know what, I, I, you have to, you have to give God credit for how you come through. Uh, there was nothing that I had to prevent him from swinging and hitting me. I couldn't have anyone. But he was trying to get set to hit me and I just sort of stumbled into him and he bowled over and, and, and then I reached up and began pulling myself up into the car. And as I said yesterday, the, uh, uh, camera car with my Pfeiffer kept the door. Right. See, had he closed the door, I uh, had driven off, I would have died right there. Okay. See, we, 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 we talk about how good God is and how he provides for any eventuality. See, we, we've got to remember that God does move in human affairs. He does do some critical things. So, and, and the camera car that is our vision, viewed it then. My feet were sticking out as the car pulled off and turned left uh, from Phillips High School. We went on over to the hospital. Were there any uh, efforts on the part of the movement to have others there, other black people there, when you were going in or nearby or anything that? <laughs> Reverend Woods always tell now when he introduces me about, about how he was, uh, this is, this is always a joking thing. Yeah. And I had decided, we had gotten together and I said, Wood, I want you to drive me. Wood was kind of nervous. He said, I, 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 I. From fact, who was real bold. I said, I'll drive. He said, yeah, yeah, if I, you drive. <laughs> and Wood tell that he viewed the scene and kept close eyes on us around the corner from the, where the action took place. He was there. He was at the other side of Philip Hyde, but he didn't come and get into the believe, but he observed what was going on. But I, we, people are always in thrill, uh, thrilled to hear him tell uh, how he was working quite as brave. He, he always said, well, I always thought Fred was trying to get us killed. <laughs> <laughs> but we're on the hospital, and I think I was telling you about uh, how those nurses were. One, it's amazing how even white people had different conceptions of things. One was quite vit vitriolic, the thing that I was a damn fool with this and that. Now, anybody who let that say, why would you do that? But they were cleaning me up, you see, mm -hmm. getting me ready for the doctor to come. And I had said once, you wouldn't understand about told you. And, and I didn't say anymore, because the other girl would kill me. You know, was both of them white. Mm -hmm. Saying, well, you, he already told you, but I'm but I just came, so I didn't say anything. Okay. And it's amazing. You might wonder sometimes how I was feeling and what I was thinking about. Yeah. Yeah. That's obviously, you know, what I'm thinking about after going through all that, you still have your wits about you. 
I had my wits. I was calm, as I said, when the doctor finally came in, took my pressure first. And I think it was amazing that my pressure was normal. God controlled things. I wasn't nervous. And uh, as I told you, most of the ambulatory people come down the hall and was looking. There I was lying on this like a skin pig, I guess. My little girl, there's some pictures you have already of her sitting by me, the oldest child. And uh, the doctor came, and of course, he was so very apologetic. I felt sorry for him. But my mind was on the fact that I had to get to the movement that night. Because I knew with the tensions mounting, the police had been harassing us. and with my, my being mobbed, it was all over the paper. I had to at least put in a presence at the movement. I felt I should and let them know what nonviolence meant to us at that moment and what violence would mean and would do to the movement if, uh, uh, if they engaged in violence. So the doctor examined me, as I said yesterday. Um, Quite extensively. I told him it took too many x rays. He said, I guess you know it. I'm taking all these x rays, but I have to know it. it's impossible for me to believe that you could come through all of this without any fracture. And I can't even find a contusion. I think that's a small. And I just, I always had a ready answer. Doctor, the Lord knew I lived in a hard town, so He gave me a hard stood. That seemed to look like relieve Him. If you yeah, understand, we both discussed the fact that God was in it, you know, God did. And He asked me, uh, He'd like to observe. He said, You really need to be in the hospital. And I'd like to observe you overnight at least. And that just wouldn't check with me because I said to him, my doctor, if I go home and die, I die among my friends. And if you order me to stay here, uh, you have to have at least two, two people inside the room, two on the outside. And automatically I began thinking that if I had to stay, I would have written out some directions for the movement. They expected me. Right. See, see, the movement expected me to give them direction. Mm -hmm. and, and I knew that they were depending on me. So he said, I was real pleased when he said, uh, Reverend, although I, I can't force you to stay, but I really wish you would. And I told him, I said, if I go home, I die among my friends over here. I can't have anything to do with, with my death if I die. He said, I understand. So he released me reluctantly. And I went home and I had, I was struck on his, I thought his wrist was broken. And my knee, well, I'd been scout, I was scout all over. You know, really, we were as white on the house kids as anybody else. Um, I've been, I struck, I struck here. Back of my head, I had some scars and pointed out that CBS film. I forget where they are now. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, so there were cameras on the scene. Oh, yes, yes, there were cameras just, and they knew it. They didn't, they didn't care. They intended to get it on. They intended kids, SOB, and other names that we call them. Uh, but I wasn't fearful. It's it's what amazing. Was going through your mind at the time that all <laughs> of this is going on. I know you was. I, I knew <laughs> people asked me that, and I know you would. Uh, you'd be amazed how your sensibilities focus on not only what is happening, but you understand the meaning of the moment, and even the needs of the moment. And you feel a sense of uh, sorrow uh, that it has to happen this way. And yet you also understand that it has to be undergone. It has to be, it's sort of akin to what, what uh, 
that the assembly will, you said, nevertheless, if it's your will. I do, and you, you resigned to death. See? You must understand, I, I had no hesitation. If death had come that day, I believe the Lord would have been ready for me. But I was most sorry for these men. You can't understand, as I said in that film, how otherwise sensible, ordinary citizens could allow themselves to be hooked up into a mob. And they knew that they were being photographed, but they didn't care. Explain that. How can you be taking all of this punishment, this brutality, and you are feeling sorry for your attackers? Well, let's don't think that anybody can do it if God's spirit. You must understand that we are, we're human beings, we are flesh. But there's something about us that's above and beyond our flesh, our spirit. And that's what's connected to God. And if people can realize that we are become a little bit more spiritual and receive divine unctions and impulses and directions from the great spirit of the universe, all of us could do better. And we would feel less. You see, now Charles Billups, when he was taken out later on, he was 15 by the Ku Klux Klan. And I think they tied him to a tree and uh, branded KKK on his stomach and beat him up. And he was in the hospital. That's Sunday morning, Nelson Smith. And I went over to visit him. And I could hear him before we got in. And he was saying, the first words he said to us, you know what? I felt sorry for these men. I said, Lord, forgive them, for they don't know what they're doing. You see what I mean? Yeah. This is what God puts, makes available to us okay. if we would use it. Right. And it, it would uh, really do with a lot of our anger. Okay. And it's sort of what King was talking about. If you can understand the spirit of nonviolence, even though you hurt, you don't want to hurt anybody else. You don't want to see anybody hurt. But, but in a crisis, in a, in a moment of really death, when you can't do anything but die or live according to God's will. You can be committed. You can be uh, resigned, and yet you can be prayerful. And I was not only resigned to whatever God wanted, I was prayerful, but I was also determined to use whatever little strength I had and commitment to get to the meeting that night, because I had to speak to them so that they could control our emotions and control the anger and the, the rage. And <clears throat> so I went home and uh, they took me home and naturally people came in all through the day, but I was trying to relax and everything. And I would speak, but uh, my mind was on that night because I knew there was gonna be a multitude around New Hope, across the First Avenue Battle. And I didn't know how extensively I was hurt. So uh, my arm was, was, was sort of aching, and I, we had to put that in a sling so I wouldn't, if you hold it down, it would be worse. So I put it in a sling. Not for dramatic effect, because I never believe you put it on there. I'm a, I detest people who put on the show. But I think uh, the biggest show that was ever put on was was Calvary for us, and I don't think we ought to be put on the show. And that wasn't a show that was real, that was God's love. And so we ought to be involved in realness, insofar as humanly possible. And anyhow, this isn't the sun, but it, it's what I feel. Uh, I asked the Lord, I remember that day, to not let me sink into a, because I realized when you hit on the brain and beat all over a lot, and I told you I'd taken at least eight or ten blows directly on my head. Uh, not to sink into a state where I couldn't command my facilities. Uh, and at least couldn't be, wouldn't be um, communicable to the people that I went to see. And I didn't want to, and I really didn't want to develop a feeling of anger. And I did, thank God. Because Angry people don't express things best, even that 
good intentions. They don't express it best when you're angry. And so, um, and as, as the Lord would have it, I just lay down and relax. Because see, I knew God didn't control my friend. If you know he's in control, and if you know at least you're doing what you're supposed to do, that's a strength in that. That's a sort of a resignation that you've done a job or you were trying to do. And we well, said, if you love the Lord that God, all our heart, mind, soul, and strength. So if you give it all, you have nothing to fear. And I think that's the meaning. If you lose, for his sake, you'll find, you'll find better luck. And, and so I got up uh, that evening and put on a uh, uh, clothes, and I had to put my hand on a sling because it was actually aching. And my knee was struck. And I'm trying to see, I believe if I recall, I had it. I came because I didn't want to give weight in my knee. I said yesterday that uh, I said I love it you that I had blood in my urine that afternoon when I got home. But that's the only time I ever saw the blood. I expected it more than I told the doctor. And he, he thought that I was going to have that's going to keep him trusting, but I never had to call him back. Sorry. Yeah. And so my, my mind and I was going to this meeting. And actually, there were so many people around the church. People couldn't even get in the church. Yeah. We couldn't get in. The church was full. And, it was around. and I said to them, you know, they were so glad to see me. And they were, and, and to see me in a sling and with a stick, you know. Right. And then I was scarred. You could visibly see my stuff. Uh, it, it, it really set them off. And I was listening as I go in, you know. I said, I, I, I speak to you when I get back, so they made way for me to get into church. And I got into the um, church and went up there, and everybody was glad to see me. And they were really incensed at how I, mean, I, I looked. Feel, yeah. yeah. I looked so. And my idea was that here, nonviolence lives or dies. And how do you express it? How do you do it? And I wasn't thinking so much about that because, as I told you before, God had always given me the red of words. I didn't have to sit down and think what I was going to say. Mm -hmm. And I don't think really people need to put on. You ought to be yourself. Mm -hmm. Being your best self, connected with the best about you, you know, inside and outward, is what makes the best communication in the so I didn't have a right written speech or nothing. And I didn't intend to stay because I was beating up in here. And when I got there and I sat on the platform, I didn't go behind the thing. And I sat on the edge of the platform and I said, you, I hope you'll forgive me if I sit down a bit. As you can see, I'm a little wounded. And I, another thing that people feel like you have to face issues head on, you can't back off. You don't need to cut around, do subterfuge. I said, well, all right, uh, how many of y'all mad in here tonight? Everybody ready. Mm -hmm. In fact, you mad as hell, huh? Yeah, yeah, yeah. In fact, I thought you could tap the town, couldn't you? Yeah, yeah. We don't, well, this ain't going to get, and someone said, they ain't going to get away with this and all this kind of stuff. And I said, well, uh, I can understand this. I can understand how you feel. I said, but you know what I've been telling you all the time? This is the price of it. I said, now, uh, since you're mad, say, anybody here mad? I said, well, now, you know, it's amazing. I said, I'm not mad. And how many of y'all were beaten up? Raise your hand. I said, nobody was beating up with me. I said, well, straight, I'm, I was beaten up, and, and I'm not mad, and I'm not angry, because I know this is what it takes for. And I, then I said, this is what, this is sort of akin to what the Lord has to go through with it. God of his enemy. And you know, it's an amazing thing how that how that they settle down. I said, so you would tell everybody inside and outside that we tonight are going to have our meeting, and I'm sorry I can't stay with you. I've got to go back home and go to bed. But you would have our meeting, and when we get through, we're going home, going through the streets, nonviolent. And not mad. I don't want to win a pain bush nowhere. And if anybody does do it, I want you to report to me so I can tell them 
the police at that point in need to try to make the movement. And I think that saved. Uh, it was God's way of preserving what we had done to build on. And by my being, I guess, the leader who was willing to suffer, like this, Tony had a destiny. You know, the movement had a lot of anger in them. They had far less crime during that, those terrific days than they had since. Because you had people who were committed to something. Mm -hmm. And and uh, I don't want to mix a whole lot of things. I want you to. Sorry. But I remember the second time, the second bus ride, remember when the, the dubious ruling about uh, sit up front and read a request? Right. And this time, I uh, we had 13 people arrested instead of calling home. You, you didn't ride that time. I didn't ride, but I was arrested. arrested. <laughs> <laughs> I was always the king that got got in there in trouble. So they get me for conspiracy, yeah. calling a breach of peace, and all this kind of stuff. <laughs> But the point of being that is while I was in jail, uh, one guy was 74 years old that time, same day and night. Hmm. And old people back there used to wear handkerchiefs on their heads. So we didn't jail. And, oh, I don't remember how many of us were in that cell, but cell 89. Hmm. Cell about like this. And I was lining up uh, on the top bunk, there's another bunk of dying, and people were talking. And this man in his hand, I, I was kidding him about his head rag, you know. And he he came over to me to the bunk and said in front of him, he said, you know, he said, the day is my birthday. He said, I'm 74 years old today. He said, I've been living all my life and I just found a day something to live for. Segregation, you see, took incentive. There was no, there was nothing. Uh, as I used to say sometimes do a nine speech. We knew back then what we could not be. Yeah. Young people now have to realize and prepare for what they can be right. and move on. Yeah. But if we did all of this, if we had that kind of courage, if young people who helped yeah. even to win the movement had the courage, knowing what they couldn't be, to struggle nonviolently in a, in a directed way and take direction, then what are we going to be doing now right. when we can be anything? Yeah. See, they were talking about a black man running for president or vice president. Just yeah. think of this. Yeah. Unthought of. Posit unthought of. Mm -hmm. Here in the city, couldn't be a policeman, couldn't be a farmer, couldn't drive a bus. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, we have to say these things. And young people will have to talk to young people. It may be true that uh, sometimes young people don't listen to their elders or something. And maybe, maybe it is a period of disillusionment with the system, but young college people, young people who aren't in college will have to say to others, look, you, we depend on you, you're part of us, and we all are part of the future. How many times did you go to jail? <laughs> I quit counting about 30, I think it was 25 or 30 something. Was there any time uh, that stands out in your mind uh, of events that took place once you were in jail? Well, you must remember that I had a consciousness of what people could do to me mm -hmm. in jail, that the system would kill me. And, and remember this, uh, about that time, I think a third of our police force were planned for a plan with Klan affiliate. Mm -hmm. Bull Connor had the sensibilities of friendship with the Klan. And I always, at that time, it's amazing how God could pass you. If I'm going to be arrested, there were people who uh, made sure back to the day they just followed, you know, for all of us. Okay. You mean your people? My people. And, you know, it's amazing. People do everything I say, and they would. Uh, and, and, and when I would be arrested, I knew when they wanted to arrest me, I'd be arrested at my own time. They'd be looking for me, and I'd call the chief up and say, you looking for me? Yeah, I said, well, where are you? I said, I'm so and so and so. We'll be able to get you. I said, okay, you want me to come down? No, we'll be able to get you. Mm -hmm. But I would have gotten everything ready. My 
let us dictate to Lola and Julia and, and people be knowing I'm going in the day of James Armstrong in the day of me almost. Quite a few times that I was arrested. Right. I asked him sometimes, I said, well, Danny, what you go to jail for? Where are you going? Yeah. Well, just be with you. I said, well, been in the pushing, you would probably made it democratic, but no involved in that. But, yeah. but uh, I'd always have somebody to 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 know that I got free. Yeah. And and here I am again, you must give God credit. Uh, he looks out for us. And all those policemen at this time could beat Nichols and run them off, they, they had determination for the policeman knew, you know. And there was only one time that I was arrested, I must say this to you, that I felt as if they were trying to do me in or something. They went way somewhere, and I'm back in the van, couldn't see it, night too. Um, Is this on Patty Way? Yeah, and, and, and I, they might have been picking up some people in other areas, I guess, or something. And it was rough and rough. Not like on, not on the street, you know. Were you the only one in there? Uh, I believe, I'm trying to think, I believe I was. But, uh, those people who got in my house and who uh, got and got around the movement when we were, and were always, they had some enough to, to do it in a way that police couldn't, if the police stopped and said, where are you going, go back. Others would, you know, mm -hmm. It was a thing. And speaking of, um, of uh, the loyalty and the discipline those men had, you must remember when the buses, and I, I realize I'm bringing in something here later, yeah. when the buses were going in Anderson, mm -hmm. I was getting ready to go up there because nobody could get those people out the train. Mm -hmm. And my man said to me, I said, man, we're going to take three cars. And I always say you can't carry a toothpick. Scratch yourself and take somebody else to give it. Don't get angry. Uh, you have to go and we have to go up and get them. So I'm getting in my car. They said, well, you, you don't need to go. I said, no, 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 I don't ask you to do what I don't do. He said, no, you have to stay here and lead us. We go. They said, Lord, they went into the clan. Mm -hmm. and they and got those people. Right. So we can't think of events and situations in this world unknown to the eye of God, or even unknown to his direction. Mm -hmm. I think just like he controls nature, he, he really has things to do with our fact. He doesn't make us robots. He does not take our thoughts and direct. Mm -hmm. He allows us a freedom within, but I think there is a certain direction that life is going to go in, regardless of us. Yeah. In, in the 57 or 58, there was a, a young man that was taken out into the woods and Castrated. Yeah, Judge Aaron. Judge Aaron. Um, did you know him? Or did, did I didn't know him personally. And uh, but the, the clansmen were concerned that uh, the policemen, the police, had not uh, put me out of business. Mm -hmm. They had missed me in the bombing. They had missed me in the in the mob. Mm -hmm. Uh, and I kept going. I was suing the city and all this kind of stuff. And, and uh, the man testified in trial. That they just they were just mad and they wanted to find some nigga. Mm -hmm. so they, they would have liked to got me. I understand. Of course, I'm thankful that God didn't let me go that route. He wanted me to go another route, mm -hmm. but he just caught. This Negro and Casper. And really, he would have bled to death had they not put the turpentine there for pain. They right. thought they'd give him pain mm -hmm. and it cauterized mm -hmm. the wound. Here again, the grace of God is. Mm -hmm. Tell about the terminal station incident. And this was in uh, 19. What was it? Uh, 1157. Yeah. Now, that was, that was one of two incidents. It, I have a picture of President Harry Truman coming to the terminal station. It had to be before that incident, or it might be afterwards. I'm not sure. Mm -hmm. 
because Lamar Weaver knew Mr. Truman was coming into the city. Right. It might have been after that incident. And he arranged, he wanted me to meet Mr. Truman. He, and I met him there at the station. I thought it was courageous for the President of the United States to come here knowing and stand, and I have pictures you have. Um, the terminal station um, incident came as a result of this dubious rule, intrastate versus interstate. In other words, you don't have to move if you're going across state line, but you have to segregate if you're going with interstate, intra. Which to me was sick. So in fact, I thought segregation was wrong in it. So that it's all one thing to me. And uh, I, uh, I don't know why I asked my wife to do it. Because anybody, I, at this time, I could almost ask anybody to volunteer for things. But I always had the feeling, Dr. Henley, that the person who leads really should affect, not only try to shape opinion and shape direction, but that he has a way of, give, he should give himself to what he asks others to do. I must be at the best time. And it's no different, I'm not making any uh, aspersion on anybody else, it's mm -hmm. just the way I feel. You're saying that you would not ask anyone else to do anything that you wouldn't do. Right, so. right. So I asked my wife, I said, uh, we're going down to tell this. And really, she never questioned. I said, in the morning. So I always uh, sent police notice and telegram, additional center release to the state. I had to request protection because I always felt that the police ought to be sued. You'd be in a position at least to have in court if they didn't give you protection once you have done. So that I had to give it time. So the plan would go also. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, that was another morning that death could have taken place, except that it wasn't God's will. So we went, I got a, I had a suitcase, and you had that picture also in your right. file. And I had my wife with me. And uh, I believe Mitchell Lindbergh was in at this time. If Bull had been in there, uh, I probably would have gotten killed. Being honest with you, because the police probably would have taken a different tack. I don't know. And I, I don't want to say bad things about Mr. Connor. He, his record is bad enough without my making it good. Yeah. Um, but we went straight up to the, the door, the white station, where you can go back to the right of 40, 20, 30, 40 feet and go in between the tunnels, mm -hmm. or between the between the white and the Negro enter. And uh, so we walked up to the front door. And these people had filled that tunnel. It was a whole lot of people, as far as I could see in them. Maybe I couldn't see all I was I was surprised that many were in there. But they had the door, I couldn't have pushed in the head I wanted to. Oh. So I walked up to the door, and you had that picture. And this was fellow with a crew cut, like a, like a German crew cut. He stood there and he said, Sean, what? we don't want you in here. I said, I don't think it's up you tell me that uh, I can't come in. And and I was saying, we were saying, didn't say that much. And they were uh, getting ready. And I, I could hear him in the background getting ready to push and make a, make a push through the door. See, while I was talking to him, I was listening to him. Then I had my, I had my hand on my arm on the right as the policeman came. They saw they couldn't get in anyway, unless they had come in and started battering folk. Yeah. So they knew that they could go in this door and, and, uh, and, and come up behind and put them out. So we were him, my wife and I, so when I saw the policeman going, I just took her hand and left this young man and said, well, right on, 
We went on behind the police, and that's how we got in in the first place. Mm -hmm. We never would have gotten into the station. No, it's all right. Oh, no, no, no. The, the mob was already there. The, the mob media. was inside. Oh, we they were inside. They were inside the train station. But we walked up to the white entrance. Mm -hmm. So they were like barricaded in the white entrance. Absolutely, absolutely. Mm -hmm. And you know, I wasn't going to go to the Negro colored entrance to test it. Right. And so, uh, the policemen, when they came up, they came up to where we were, but they didn't say anything to the man nor to me. And I guess that strategy was to get in behind him. And and and, had, and I noticed in the back of the crowd, they started pushing toward the front. Yeah. And uh, I I uh, took my wife on and run right behind the policeman and got inside because my, my, my purpose was to sit in the street. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's a big one. Yeah. To actually sit in the white room space. Did you drive there that morning or did someone bring you? Um, I either drove or was scared. I, I can't be sure. Because I was thinking if you had driven and the mob had seen you, they probably would have uh, attacked you. I might, have, I might have driven and parked my car somewhere else. Mm -hmm. it, it wasn't that I was afraid to drive. Right. Uh, and in and, and that, I'm not too sure that I was organized because I hadn't organized anybody. Mm -hmm. It was a strange thing. So normally, I had always been, but I didn't have anybody tuned up to support me in this. Mm -hmm. and just me and my wife. Mm -hmm. As I think of it, that's but one of the most indefensible situations ever. Mm -hmm. So, how did Lamar Weaver get? Well, I'm finna tell you. So, so I bought an intrastate ticket, an interstate. In trough for her, in trough for me. Mm -hmm. I think it was. And uh, we had already pre purchased the ticket. Willie Williams was uh, at uh, this university we had the other evening talking with Constance Martin. We talked about that. She was involved. Mm -hmm. And he was saying one of us had this type of ticket and one had the other. Willie Williams was a young lawyer then. Mm -hmm. And uh, so as we went in, the policemen busied themselves on getting them out, pushing them out. Right. See, because didn't any of them have any tickets anyway. <laughs> so uh, I said, uh, I wouldn't be right at the door because there were seats, most of the seats were empty. They were just ganged up at the door. So I went in the middle of the station. I wasn't gonna sit right at the door either. <sighs> It's amazing how you can get yourself so in a position so indefensible. Uh, and so I was at, and then the policeman, as they were getting them out, one man, one policeman came in and said, Do you have a ticket? So he was going to arrest me if I didn't have a ticket. Right. Which I had too much sense to go in there without a ticket. Mm -hmm. I said, Officer, oh, you know I have some nice to have a ticket, so I put my ticket out of here. He didn't say it anymore. Mm -hmm. I said, you know, I have something I'm not coming to this day without a ticket. <laughs> so he didn't say anything in. And it wasn't a uh, whole. Oh. So I sat there and he went on. And it was, I guess, less than five minutes at the most that Lamar Weaver came in through that same door and uh, came to sit down with us. You got that mighty man's courage, whether he's a fool or not, people have to do it. Mm -hmm. And uh, the policeman came in, and here's a white man, you know, sitting with a Negro in the house of that, so never them, them, I guess. But, but they, he went by the legal way. Where you take? He didn't have one. Mm -hmm. okay. He didn't have one, so he, they had to put him out. So they put him out right out the same the door, into the mob. And the mob sat on him, and, 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 uh, they were pummeling him, and he had a canvas top Cadillac, as I recall. And I didn't see this. Mm -hmm. See, I don't want to give myself credit for things I didn't see. Right. But Timmy they rocked his car and almost tore the cameras off and off, and he battled got away with his life. Mm -hmm. yeah, and the police arrest him. The police arrested him for running over red line. He did gave him a ten dollar ticket. Mm -hmm. This is this was Birmingham in those days. You know, in um, 1959, after you had gone through all of this, you what you're doing is developing the nonviolent protest movement. 
1959, CBS, I believe, did a, a documentary on Malcolm X that was shown nationwide. Uh, I guess this is really the first time that the Nation of Islam was introduced nationally. How did that impact upon the, the civil rights, the, the traditional civil rights movement? Well, we didn't have too much to live so with the mathematics. People, I think people didn't mind anybody who would protest segregation. Mm -hmm. And of course, uh, Malcolm X and others did protest a lot. They didn't do a lot of suffering like we did against it. And I never, I never got in a contest with them. I never didn't want to get into a situation where the system would have blacks fighting each other. Mm -hmm. And you know, Dr. King said, and I believe that, that really a man ought to be free. And if he goes after his freedom, different from us, even in a, even in a violent way. Uh, Dr. King thought it was better for a man to be violent, trying to get freedom, than to be totally passive and enslaved. Mm -hmm. The only thing he uh, said was that you ought to be willing to take the consequences for your actions. Mm -hmm. That's it's what's bothering people today. We want to act without being responsible. Mm -hmm. 1960 is the year of the city. And yeah. Paul Connor made the statement. And the city had gone on all around the world. He assured the people of Birmingham that there would not be city. But you know, it's 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 not been act, accurately written. I had to be in High Point, North Carolina, the same day the city in the Senate area, High Point, Greensburg, right. uh, B. Elton Cox was a small, small fellow then. He's heavy now, he's up in uh, Someplace Illinois above Chicago. I saw him here about nine months ago. Mm -hmm. But uh, he had invited me to come up to speak, just like people do now. Mm -hmm. And uh, the group, the sit in started there. And so when he picked me up at the airport, he said, Come on, I want you to go with me. Before I would speak that night, this was in the afternoon I got there. We went by. Uh, with Lunch County and Green Bar and another place that close. And we went by and sat in with the students. That's not really basically written mm, that's right. history. But I was there when it started. And I was the one who called back to SCLC's office. Ella Baker was our executive secretary then. Mm -hmm. And I said to her, tell Dr. King this is a new departure. And, and, and that we have to support these students. Uh, so that's the beginning of SNCC. That's the beginning of Yeah, SNCC came out of that. Mm -hmm. uh, and, but I was in it then, and I called back, so SCLC was knowledgeable that the series was going on. Mm -hmm. But I spoke that night in High Point and commend them and said that we'd be on. So Bull Connor then comes up mm -hmm. over. It's amazing how you can put a little man in a big place and he makes the place either small or terrible. And leadership is what this country needs and they're all time and in every good in every place. At any rate, uh, he assured the citizens of Birmingham that there would not be sitting in Birmingham out of it. And of course, I never thought nothing. We never intended to have massive cities in women. First of all, we didn't have money. Mm -hmm. Excuse me, we didn't have the national backing to do it, but but I know Mr. Connor could not prevent Negro from sitting in. So I just made a statement that it is an insult to the Negro people for Mr. Connor to say that he can he can prevent us from sitting in if we want to sit in. That will be sitting in. Well, that's a challenge, you see. And, and, and I had to mount the challenge, the idea of challenge anyway. Because you cannot submit to, to segregation. Now, how it was going to be done, I did not say. Mm -hmm. Most people expected that you got to have massive sit in. And uh, if you want me to go in and explain how it was done, yeah. I would. Okay. 
I knew that in Birmingham, Alabama, if we were going to have sit-ins, it had to be selected and it had to be uh, time and we had to have students that didn't have criminal records and so forth. So Bill, Charles Bill was my key person. And we arranged to get five students from Miles and five from uh, Daniel Page. And we met up at my house. And I was in a new part of now across the street that we'd been. And uh, we were, we sat there and I told them it had to be time. They had to have um, collars and ties on them. And they, And I told him that all the stores were being watched. This kind of had special people. And I'm going to give him credit. They, they were really ready. We couldn't have amounted massive sit ins if we wanted to. Uh, but the police were ready to be carrying anybody from the store. But that wasn't our thing. We wanted to get in and do it in a way to show that we could outdo the segregation. So, we chose the five stores, Prisons, uh, Ludlam, uh, Newberry, I forget the Brits, Brits for five mm -hmm. And I said to them, now, we'll have a car to take you not to the door, but within 40, 50 feet in, in the sidewalk. And you must be aware of the policeman. And it was going to be two. And have books, you know. And we gave them uh, money to buy a hank. They had to buy something because they went into court and didn't buy anything. Right. Earl McBee, the city of Solicitor, they had begun attacking by, yeah, you went in there to do this thing and this. Yeah, you went in there to sit in. So we said, no, we bought something. Right. So we gave them money. And then I said, uh, time. The, uh, I said, we identified where each lunch counter was in each store. And they had to, uh, at a certain time, they would go in on one store away from the counter so they wouldn't kick the eye of the police. And within, the, within three minutes, they would be uh, on the floor where the counters were, but not near the counter. They would, before this time, though, they would buy a handkerchief or something in there. And 11.30 was the, the deadline hour. And they would, would, would be within 20 feet of the counter by 11.29, <laughs> doing something, not even looking at the counter. Doing, and, but at 11.30 sharp, they would make it to the counter and sit in, not together, but among the whites. <sighs> now, this shows you how prepared we were. At 11.35, they were already in jail. That's <laughs> all right. They were set at 11.30 sharp. At 11.35, they were already in the day. Mm. And of course, uh, I never said it, as you know. Mm. I, Charles Billington and I went down. He, we got, what, five convictions out of the city that we never said it. Mm. That was, was it with Charles Billington, sir? Uh, Hendricks, I believe it's a couple of Hendricks brothers that actually went out to the airport to sit in uh, at the Dobbs house, I believe it was called at that time. Uh, and if they, I think, told me he had kept the sandwich. At the <laughs> yeah, and you know, now that was that was something that wasn't necessarily the plan, but it showed that the people had the spirit. Mm -hmm. See. I wasn't concerned about any more sitting, sitting. Mm -hmm. but they want, they knew that my spirit was we attack segregation everywhere. Right. Yes. See, so that this this was on their own, and it really, I thought it was a beautiful thing. Mm -hmm. Sixty-one was the year of freedom rides. Yeah, and this is the uh, the situation with Anderson. It appeared that, and I believe you said this. It appeared that. Anytime anything is happening in civil rights, 
in that era, like Birmingham, I mean, Alabama was sort of focal point. Yeah. Well, yeah, you know, it, 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 first on the roll call of states. First, um, at that time, in instances of tragic consequences and foolishness and stupidity. And the legislators and the governors had no uh, hesitation in calling anything gun and civil rights and, and stirring up the people so that naturally this was where, where we're going to be. That's a, that's a script in the Bible that said, light shines in darkness and the darkness can't stop it. I believe in that and that's why and my being here, you know, that's another thing. Now, the, the, the uh, sit-in was starting to go to New York. Mm -hmm. I didn't have anything to do with it. When I knew anything, it was being announced. And they charted the route mm -hmm. from Alabama, Mississippi. You mm mean -hmm. freedom rides? Yeah, I mean freedom rides. Mm -hmm. from, from D.C., when you come down from D.C.? Well, DC it was planned in New York, York and mm -hmm. D.C., but it started in D.C. Mm -hmm. And I wasn't in on the plan. Right. So when did you find out that they were headed to, to Alabama? Did you not find out about that until the incident in Anderson? No, I, I knew uh, that they were going to come into Georgia and then to Birmingham. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm trying to see how did I have the communication? A lot of things escaped. Mm -hmm. I might have had some communication from someone in Atlanta, mm -hmm. and I believe uh, someone in New York, I don't even know who it was. Mm -hmm. You must remember, however, that uh, when at these day time, at these times, whenever my long distance call, my phone rang, it's automatically heard in the police station. Mm -hmm. Cause when I pick up my phone many times, I can hear police giving signals out and this and that. Mm -hmm. And one time I was a four-way hookup Police, the hospital, and the ambulance says in, in my And you wouldn't believe it that there was a time in my phone would just keep ringing at night and I'd take it up off the hook and it would ring off the hook. That had to be from downtown. Mm -hmm. So, um, and that's a long, this, this freedom of mine, because it, 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 it got hung up here. Right. And the federal government got in. This is, you're in a terrific point now because we had always wanted to involve the federal government in seeing to it that the local people, local police, uh, protected us. Right. So the freedom rides were really basically the beginning mm -hmm. of the actual involvement. Of, and, and, if, if, and if you had, we had loads of Kennedy's telephone call to me and others as we got started. But let's get started talking about it. So they came uh, in in and uh, and got hung up in Atlanta uh, in Anderson. Mm -hmm. uh, James Peck uh, and others were were beaten up. There was a Sunday, as I recall, I was it was happy near one o'clock or twelve or something because I was dismissing service when somebody came up and said. As a young black man, I did blood. So I went outside, out in front, and he was blood. By the time I talked to him, he was come some more. And then here comes this white man with his skull. But the first time I saw a human skull was James Peck. They hit him with an iron pipe and just bushed his, his flesh. And someone brought them out to your church? Yeah. Well, where else could they go? They were already told that they could get in touch with me. Okay. See, so that, that was that was why they came to my place. Couldn't mm -hmm. go any place else. Mm -hmm. And you know, there's some instances here that people don't know about. They intend to turn Peck over to the clan. I tell you about that. I hope. Mm -hmm. I hope to tell you about that. Mm -hmm. So Peck came. So we knew we had to get him to the hospital. And I, I would imagine that let's say the ladies would have been warm. They, they probably do. We went into my house mm -hmm. and did best we could, and we sent him to the hospital. And he had, I think, he took over 52 stitches in his 
point in his head all over. He was really beaten up. Howard K. Smith had described it in the CBS film. And uh, so we sent Peck to the emergency of uh, him, just whatever it was called. You know. And we said to him, now you can't try to get no cabinet to come back. You, 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 you wait till they get finished with you, then you call us. Well, I was going to send one or two men back at it because I had called people going in my house anyway. And at a time like this, I had any number of people that, that was available for anything. Mm -hmm. And then I had all these people, the, the doctor and his wife from uh, Detroit, all of them integrating my house. Because mm -hmm. the called out there and said, you got white niggas out there said, my baby, what you gonna do about it? <laughs> you, you, hospitals, uh, hotels wouldn't have taken them. Right. At any rate, uh, so, from let's see, from uh, from that early afternoon until until that night, at least past nine o'clock, James Peck was over University Hospital, and I have no doubt they intended to turn him over to the plane. The hospital intended to turn him over to the police. And I tell you how that. Developed. I know a lot of things went on that day. There was communication. I was called from Detroit and New York. And, and of course, when they called me, we were calling everybody who. Mm -hmm. But I had to be yeah. on the scene. But they were in my house. And we made sure there wasn't nobody going to the family, anybody else uh, uh, involved in you. I don't know what it was, what, 12, 13, 14? Uh, mm -hmm. Young people, white and black. So, uh, did they stay at your house? Yeah. Did they stay? Did, did, were all of them there, or did they stay at other people's homes? At mine. This is your house. I don't remember anybody taking because we'd have had danger, you know. Mm -hmm. You wanted to be centrally yeah. located, so yeah. everybody would be. Yeah. There. Yeah. Now, if, uh, if if it was, but I had people if I had needed to put them somewhere. Mm -hmm. But I don't recall now anybody take me. If it would have been, it would have been some trusted person like Colonel Johnson or somebody to come there and right. take him. But uh, Did you talk about Peck? Peck is the main focus mm -hmm. at the moment. Mm -hmm. so, I, so we gave him a dime. And, and uh, so he called. And almost as if it was something speaking to me. So why don't you go? Normally I would have sent two men mm -hmm. to the car. Mm -hmm. And then we had um, always two the other cars following them for to be sure they, you know. Mm -hmm. And I stayed home to find out what happened. I would have stayed home to find out what happened. But tonight I some said to me, you go. And if I hadn't, I'm sure Pat would have been turned over to. The uh, plan. So I said to him, now, when he called, I said, Now we're going to come up and drive right under the shed, and you get out and get in the back. We're going to go and just come right on out and get in, and then we're going to pull up. So there were several cars, and that you had driven your car in park, but you may get in another somebody else's car and drive. So I was in the car with someone who was in another person's car. And uh, we do one so when we pull in, we know it's a three wheel policeman sitting right at the door, one down the street, two, three police cars, space. And uh, so we pulled in and he came out and got in in the back seat. So I'm sitting on the passenger side and this other man in the back. Now the other cars were following inconspicuously to see what happened. Mm -hmm. If anything had happened to the hospital, anywhere else, we would have known. And so we came out the Avenue F, 6th Avenue, and come up to the one way coming across, which is 21st, isn't it? Right. When we pulled off, the three wheeler pulled off right behind us. And uh, when we got into the street good, the 
police car that was sitting down the street pulled off. And uh, there's another three wheeler in front of us, and when we passed them, they got behind. And so we went up from, what is that, 20th Street to 27th. Mm -hmm. and by the time we got to, to 22nd Street, there were at least two police cars behind, but the three wheelers were up with us. And they made sure that we got a home in Vida where we couldn't turn off a boat, couldn't run or nothing. And by the time we got uh, not to the midpoint, but up far enough so we couldn't get off in a place, to maybe a third of the way, this three wheel comes up to this truck uh, and to the driver's side, pull over. And I, instead, when we pull off from the hospital, I said, I don't go over 10 miles an hour. I'm not going to have a speed ticket or anything yet. So the policeman said, what's your name? And I said, where are you going, boy? Something like that. He said, I'm going back over to uh, North Birmingham. He said, what's your name? He told me his name. Said, Let me see your driver's license. Uh, where your car registration? So he, he told me he was in another car. Oh, a stolen car. I didn't say anything until he said that, but I knew where he was going. And so he said, oh, you got a stolen car here. I said, also, I'm sure you know that this man would not come over here in a stolen car. I said, I'm sure you know that everybody's aware of what's going on in this city, and I'm sure that you're not going to arrest anybody here for a stolen car tonight. He said, what the hell you got to do with it? I said, I got everything to do with it. Well, who the hell are you? I said, I'm Reverend F. L. Shulsworth, and I'm sure you know the name. But it won't be no, it won't be no stuff tonight. He said, what did you say your name is? I said, F. L. Shulsworth, and you know it well. So you got him. He said, so on, so on. Shulsworth with And you can hear him talking. He said, so on, so on, so on. Shulsworth with He said, oh, hell, let him go. I'm hearing this. They would have detained him. So we went on and Peck uh, got safer to the house. And I thank God always that I was there that night because it would have been a calamity. But another black mark on Birmingham. But one day then we were in the house all next day when I the government, you see. We, at this time, we had begun pressing in the, from New York and all around the government to see to it that people were protected. That people traveling Interstate, interstate, and all that would be actually protected by the police department. Right. So then the White House gets involved in it. Robert Kennedy was President Kennedy's uh, point man. Right. You know, I, we were in Robert Kennedy's office when Meredith was put in the Mississippi. Oh, yeah. yeah, and been in a number of times. But at this time, he called to ask God, uh, what do we do? I said, well, these people are here and they, they've, got to, they've got to get off. Uh, and, and you can assist us and seem to it that we protect them and so forth and so on. Very polite. And they had already called the police, Bull Connor, use it, and the governor also. So, um, I think we sat in the station as they were trying to go out and the white, the bus driver refused to do so. We stayed in the station all night. So, and I wish the public could hear the conversation between Robert Kennedy and me. So Kennedy called me and home. And I went down the bus station and said, well, what can I do? I said, well, you can, can, can get the, uh, you can, you can see if you can get the bus and roll. He said, well, White folk, white, white driver won't drive, well, tell them to get a Negro. <laughs> I said, well, you know, they ain't gonna hire no Negro here. No. And he was saying to me, first of all, could I negotiate with the bus? I said, I, I don't hire buses. I'm not into that. You all see to these people doing They said, well, uh, uh, tell me that the white drivers won't drive. I put a Negro drive on an Air Force jet and be there within an hour. <laughs> then the whites decided they were going to drive. Mm -hmm. See? 
Uh, and of course, it was, there were thousands of people around that bus station. It was it's amazing something didn't happen. Uh, and so I was, was this day and night. They we went there today. But you know, we you stayed, stayed all night. night. Yeah. They had to stay all night. We ate everything yeah. out of there. And you know, it was an amazing thing. You know, I walked out and among those families, like walking in this place mm -hmm. and didn't fear and and they knew who I was. Mm -hmm. Uh but I went and I thought to go out and do something. I went home a couple of times, came back. Uh, so. But every time a bus driver came and he found out what was happening, he would not drive. Right. So uh, I told Mr. Ken, I wasn't negotiating with no bus drivers. I don't have no high drivers. Very courteous, very pointed though. Mm -hmm. And so, and every time he called, go and we get cursed out. But he would tell us that you have to do your job, or we do ours. You know, we don't want to put marshals in there, but we can fabulize the troops that we have to. You know, all this. It, it's, it's amazing the use of power, mm -hmm. but knowing how to use it is what's important. Mm -hmm. And naturally, the local officials didn't want to be superseded, so right. they had to give appearances that they would reluctantly go along there so far. But here's the point I want you to get to. Well, I was kidding, it was so happy. When finally the bus drivers agreed to drive. So he called me back. He said, Mr. Sean Gwen, he said, I understand the driver's gonna drive. Yeah. I said, now, he said, Do you have to go through uh, Mississippi? I said, Yeah. He said, Oh God. Reverend said, the Lord ain't been in Mississippi a long time. I said, that's why we want to go, Mr. Kendrick, so that uh, we can get the Lord in Mississippi. <laughs> He said, he said, my God, well, can't you go? He said, can't, can't you go to New Orleans? I said, Mr. Kennedy, I didn't sit around. I said, the right was sitting in Washington, in New York. You know about that. He said, I'll tell you what, I'm going to make arrangements for, for, for the, I'm going to call him Governor of New Orleans, of, of, of Louisiana. And he suggested that we go to New Orleans, Louisiana. I said, Mr. Kennedy, didn't you say that the government can't tell people in a free country where to go? So these people are going to Mississippi. And that's when he asked me, he said, uh, are you going with them? I said, Mr. Kennedy, I don't ask people to do what I don't do. He said, oh my God, I hadn't thought about that. And then, you know, I was arrested. Mm -hmm. I'm sure then he made up his mind that if I got killed, it wouldn't be the tragedy. So you think that they had you arrested. I think Bobby Kennedy made a deal with, with Chief Damon Moore mm -hmm. to arrest me. Because, you know, they, when the buses did roll, I'm a little ahead of myself. Mm -hmm. uh, you see, the, the, uh, the, 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 uh, the whites, you must remember now, don't get it confused, the original group didn't ride the buses. They had to go back to my house, and they they tried to get off on a plane. Remember, they got off. They flew on a plane. That's right. Some students came. In. Yeah. And here again, it's a whole. I told you, this is a long thing. Yeah. So I get a call when they flew off the plane. Had the plane flying off and clapping, clapping because they couldn't get out on the bus. I get a call, and I'm supposed to go out of town to speak somewhere. Mm -hmm. Reverend Charles Well. Yeah, this is Diane Knight's brother. Students at Matt. I said, How are you? She said, Well, the students have decided to uh, kick up the bus ride. I said, Young lady, you realize that somebody can get killed here? And, and uh, do you know what is happening? She said, Yes, we know. And we, we don't think that violence is supposed to stop this. I was so glad, and yet I was shaking in my boots that some more people are going to come in and really get. Right. Messed up. I said, "Well, do y'all have to?" She said, "Oh yeah, we have voted to come, and 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 uh, they're on that way." I said, "Well, we have to." I said, "You know, I'm supposed to go out of the city, but I have to be here. I can't let y'all come in here, and we, and and nobody knows." She said, "Well, that's why we contact, let you know we're coming." She said, "The group will be coming tonight." Well, we took the first people back, you know, and put them out. Two o'clock in the morning at the Nashville line. 
So she called me back. I said, well, we have, and I knew that I was being heard, but sometime when they're busy doing other thing, I said, well, let's develop this thing. You send your governor and your police commissioner uh, exactly when they're coming. And, I, and then you called me and said, the chickens are on their way. If some will be roosters, that mean men. Uh, Pullet would be young women, hens, old women. Dominic, mixed race, mixed. Mm-hmm. And you tell me, then I'll call my police commission and tell them what time y'all are supposed to get here. So they, by the time they go, they thought he had freed himself, but the group was in here. She said, the chickens are on the way. Some are rednecks and Dominic's. And <laughs> it was, it was. It was beautiful. The Lord was with us. And so they got in and 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 we were hung up there at the bus station. Uh, now I was in and out because I was going to be sure. And this is where Robert Candy called me, you know. What can we do? Whites won't drive. Well, can you talk with him? I said, I, I, I'm not negotiating. Well, tell me, get it. When I told him that uh, the Kenneth said he'd have a black driver in the Air Force debt within the hour, uh, then it was decided that they were going, going to drive. Mm-hmm. Meanwhile, President Kennedy had decided to send his special, uh, what you call it, assistant, John Sigginsaw, mm-hmm. who was beaten up in one government. And so, because uh, if I had been in it, I'm sure now I would have been killed because, and I think John Siggins, although we were speaking at University of Northern Kentucky, and I said, well, you, you got to be that for me, so I want to be that. I said, a white man, I said, I said uh, the thing going to get better when white men are beating up in Negro places. I just put it like that. But back to the, the thing here. Uh, so they finally got Everything ready to go. When I, I always had something to get my ticket. Mm-hmm. So I'm getting the bus is finally rolling. A lot of things happen. So the bus is finally getting ready to, to go in. I'm making sure everybody is ready, you know. And it's amazing. So many clamoring around the bus station. There's nobody bothered me. Uh, and so I decided to, when the bus was getting rolled, I, I went to get up on the, I went to step up on the bus. Chief Jamie Morse called, called by my name, Freddie Lee, are you going to ride the bus? I said, of course I'm going to ride. I said, and I flashed my ticket in him. I said, I got my ticket, I'm going to ride, you can't stop me. He said, I'm going to give you a lawful order to, uh, what do you say? To not ride the bus or something like that. And if you don't, I'm going to arrest you for refusing to obey a lawful order of a police. I said, you can't give me no lawful order not to ride. I got a to ride and the right to ride. So I'm going, you know, ignoring him. I'm going to step up. And I got to the middle of the step, I think the middle step. And he grabbed me right in my collar. Just gently pulled me and then snapped. Mm-hmm. Gently pulled me down. It took me a day and said, I'm arresting you for... Uh, refusing to obey an order. I'm sure that as as I look at now that Kennedy had decided that I shouldn't get killed mm-hmm. because he knew I was going to ride. I said, I don't ask other people to do what I don't do. Mm-hmm. He said, you must go. I said, I must go. Well, you know, they rode into Mobile, uh, into Montgomery and it was a fiasco. Beating up, boys teeth knocked out and it was just terrible. Uh, well, I'm in jail. Mm-hmm. See, yeah. you're safe in jail. No, but I wasn't safe. I'm trying to get out, mm-hmm. and immediately, my, uh, I was bonded out. But the buses had already gotten to my room, so I got in my car. And uh, the first time that I've been photographed without my mustache, I've had mustache since I was 14, mm-hmm. was I was rushing. You know, getting ready to go to Montgomery that night, mm-hmm. and I had whacked too much on. I just whacked it all off, made my lips look like it's swollen. 
But I got in the car and I flew to one. They could have arrested me for, for, for flying. But I got out of that night, and it was a night of nights. The, the, the federal marshals were there. The Klan was really, they were really upset. Mm. And we went Ralph Abbott at the strips, the first Ralph the strip. And I don't recall any incidents of my getting in, but I got, and I'm, it might have been that, that, that some men drove me down, but they would drive me anyway. Or I might have driven myself, I don't remember at the moment, but, but uh, I got out and, got, and went into the church and tear gas smell, first time I ever smelled tear gas. Mm. Uh, and tear gas smell in the church? Yeah. They, 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 the marshals had to use tear gas, them crammed on the outside. And so we were there that night. And uh, we were talking. Martin and Ralph were glad that I got there because they were a little bit unsure about what had happened. And then the governor had declared limited martial law. See, Kennedy had forced him to, to do something because he would have federalized the guard. Hmm. So they allowed uh, Patterson, was Patterson in there or Wallace, whoever was in it. Uh, Wallace. Wallace was in there. Limited martial rule, I believe mean, it was. Hmm. So Martin made that or not, it was it was good, you know. Limited martial rule, we thought it meant truth, and we were disappointed when we found it wasn't mean federal truth. Mm -hmm. It was a national state of limited. So then uh it's written somewhere, and I guess I said it's uh I never did have fear. It came at uh James Foreman, a farmer, farmer. was at the airport and he had to come in court. Yeah. And so I volunteered to go out and get him. Mm -hmm. Forget all those clam went out there and how I got him. Mm -hmm. So I went and got him. Went to the airport. And when I came back, they had really gotten ferocious. And they, 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 there was tear gas all on the outside and the marshals were being hit and all this kind of stuff. And uh James Farmer said something about he thought I was the bravest, most courageous man. And you know, when we got to where we had to go in, I said, get back, folks, coming through. And they just fell back like I was shocked myself. Mm -hmm. Well, went on through and went up into the church. And uh, then the adjutant general took over and told us all that we had to stay there. And uh, talked very nice, but he said, I insist on it. He that mix. And it was in that time that we stayed in Montgomery, so that wherever we went, we, let's see, we went, we went to Martin's house or Ralph's house, whichever. And uh, we ate, and wherever we go, the, the God would take us. We, we, we just lived in the main places mm -hmm. to go and ride in the national guard. And I, I told Martin and Ralph, I said, now we get some of our own tax money. Mm -hmm. It took us everywhere we wanted to go. And um, so we, for, I think it was for, for a day or two, we were in that situation. And then it came time for the buses to go to Mississippi. Mm -hmm. I know I don't already promise, and Ken didn't know now that I'm back in Montgomery. Also, Martin and Raff. Mm -hmm. And all of us were supposed to ride. I, I guess I don't know whether Martin was going to ride or not. I really don't know. But I was. Of course, I'm in Montgomery and I went there to the ride. They prevented me in Birmingham. Mm -hmm. And uh, so we went down, went in the white waiting room at the bus station, down to lunch counter. And, and of course, uh, I led the integration because I was going to make sure that I said, well, we, we're here and we must integrate. So we went to white, grabbed it, going to go. Martin said, well, you know we got to go because if he get arrested, we don't got to see that's right, let's go. Mm -hmm. So we're in the white waiting room and white restaurant and everything. We're in the white restroom and everything. Mm -hmm. great to total. And I didn't I didn't I felt something ha happen. I didn't know what, but 
So when the buses came and people began to load up for folk, then we were arrested again in Montgomery Street. Why I keep walking? Uh, trying to see what Martin the Rath there, I'm pretty sure he was. I was and several others of us who were going to go on the bus, so they arrested us. They arrested you before you get on the bus. Before I get on the bus. And then us rolled into the bus into Mississippi. You know, there's just the people down there arrested. Right. <laughs> it, it's an amazing thing. Right. And so we were in the uh, Montgomery Day. And uh, and actually, I'm the, I'm the actionist. And Y.T. Walker also. See, one of the, you must remember, and I should say this, one of the reasons for the success of the movement in Birmingham and elsewhere was I'm an actionist, and so was Y.T. Walker. Mm -hmm. Y.T. was a dramatist, you know. We, we were right together. And, and, and what we felt, basically, Martin had to go, because Birmingham was on the mind. You all usually agree on why and I were right together on strategy and movement. Mm -hmm. In fact, we, we made most of it. Mm -hmm. And uh, so we were in jail. So we decided in jail we were going to fast and, <laughs> and not eat. And here, why? So well, we all take a little coffee for, for liquid sex. I said, no, no liquid. <laughs> <laughs> and then at night, we stayed alone at night in the uh, the we refused it. They wouldn't give us blankets or something. We had the, the sheriff come out and talk with us. We weren't going to eat. We weren't going to shave or something. It was, it was, we had to embarrass the system. Yeah. It was not that we were making, trying to make anybody look mad. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm trying to think, that's about the highlights of it, of, of, of the, mm -hmm. except for Ralph Snowing. Ralph was the world's greatest snow. Ralph was in, uh, let's see, we was jail in Birmingham, but in Montgomery was, as I recall, Ralph was, was in a cell right above me. And he started hitting those metal walls and reverberating through that. And I always said that Ralph was the world's greatest snow. But we had camaraderie, we had fellowship. We knew we were going, and we knew where we were winning. But the point here is that the government directly involved itself mm -hmm. in the protection of citizens in the performance of carrying out of their own privileges. Mm -hmm. And that was a high mark mm -hmm. for us. Mm -hmm. Of course, uh, in Mississippi, I, I, I thought that it was bad that they were turned over to the officials there. And mm -hmm. It didn't move. But you know, God has his own way. Mm -hmm. People came in Mississippi and schools and all of this stuff. and. Mississippi, Mississippi got more black people now than all the different Alabama does. Sir. So you see, it, it's it's God moving in history. Mm -hmm. Sixty-two is the year of the selected buying campaign, and that was a relationship that seemingly developed between the movement and Miles College students. Yeah, uh, can you talk about that? Well. We, uh, the movement, my position was we had to be supportive of any group, whether they were us or not. Mm -hmm. Because really in the segregation struggle, all of us is us. Mm -hmm. All of us are us, you know. Mm -hmm. And uh, and I thought it was nice for the students. They want some interdependency. Mm -hmm. And so we were supportive. And, and, and they knew also that if they didn't have the backing of the movement, if they got in trouble, they wouldn't. So we had cooperation. I was, I was really glad to see. Uh, you know, was there um, uh, also at a point in '62, the students had started doing some door-to-door -door solicitations. That were in trust person, and it's difficult sometimes to. For me, as I haven't just taken time and jot these things down. Mm -hmm. But we were always generally supportive of anything, any group, mm -hmm. including when we first started, we were here this time, but remember mm -hmm. the, the preachers wouldn't go down there all night and better than association. Right. Right. And and uh, it's interesting, I should say this because people should know. Uh, at one time where I had said, 
in the conference, they wouldn't endorse the petition for Negro police. Mm -hmm. And that's the time when he said, well, brethren, and people are talking up for this. So he said, well, don't say nothing good about it, don't say nothing bad about it, that long, it'll be gone like, in two weeks, like everything else, he was like, well, I ain't trying to do Well, I didn't take on the fence. So they organized the Betterment Association with E.W. Williams of Fairfield. Well, I took the position, as I said to our board, that we should be supportive, and we're glad that the preachers are organized. Although we knew preachers were not going to crusade. They were trying to show that they were adequate to speak words for the moment. But that era called for action, mm -hmm. and they were not actionists. <laughs> so uh, I didn't try to dominate that meeting, but Reverend Gordon and I went down to, I believe it was St. Paul Church, the one church that the Betterment Association would be, just two, three weeks after they organized. And I didn't want to state my position to them. Mm -hmm. And they, Dr. E.W. Williams was on the floor down in front talking. We sat in the back. And one or two of the people had noticed that I had come in. He was down there talking. We had quite a few preachers there. Mm -hmm. Naturally, they were good at organizing you. Mm -hmm. And he was around there saying, I'm not going to bow. Oh, it's funny. Mm -hmm. Show up that these little niggas running around here and so on, so on, so on. And I'm not going to bow. Well, and he hadn't seen me. Mm -hmm. So finally, he said that two or three times and was saying other things. And one of the fellows said, well, you ought not to talk so much. Uh, action is what's speak. Yeah, but I'm not going to I don't know what he was talking about, but he was in dialogue against me. So the man said, well, why don't you talk to the man? He's here himself. And it's, he went almost go to the floor and he looked up and saw I was there. And, so, and he said some kind of Meeting my boy, he said, Well, well, Jim, will you come on down? And we, we, we're glad you're here. And then, and, and, uh, he'd been sitting there talking since because well, he didn't know that you were. He knew I was there. Mm -hmm. And uh, so when I got up, and you know, I realized that you don't need to fight with people.